Theosu, this is your favourite dispensationalist, Pentecostal, word of faith, Bible-thumping, spirit-filled, devil-chasing, revivalist who believes in the Holy Ghost. I know we all believe in the Holy Ghost, but I am so pumped to be with you. I'm not sure how many of you are going to agree, agree with anything I say, but for the five of you that do, thank you, friends. We're going to get in the wood together. I'm believing God's going to do something. But seriously, it's an honor and a privilege. I want to say thank you to Nathan and to Gabe. I love you guys. The Finocchios are awesome. I love everything about Theos U, except uh, occasionally I, I feel offended by some of the memes. But God is helping me through that. And uh, I'm just turning to the Lord in prayer and very excited about all the other stuff. I want to talk to you today on something that's strong in my heart and in my spirit, and that is the power of the Holy Spirit. I, I don't believe there's a day in history like today where we need the closeness, the touch, the hand of God's Spirit upon our lives, or maybe, maybe some of you are in ministry, on, on, on your ministries, or wherever you're serving and wherever God's called you to, we need the anointing. We need the fire of God. And I'm believing today at the end of this uh, message, I'm going to pray and I'm going to believe that you're going to feel the touch of heaven come into your homes, wherever you're watching this, and that God's going to do something supernatural in you and through you by his grace and by his spirit. I want to speak today five reasons why our churches need the power of the Holy Ghost. Five reasons our churches need the power of the Holy Ghost. I won't Turn there. Uh, we'll get into the word in just a moment. But in Acts chapter 2, we see this early church emerge. Supernaturally birthed by the hand of God. There's 120 people gathered in an upper room. They're waiting uh, on, on a word from God for the coming of the Holy Spirit, for the touch of the Holy Spirit. They're waiting 10 days, just sitting up there waiting, waiting, waiting. And the Bible says that suddenly, I love that word, suddenly, supernaturally ordained by the hand of God, suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. It filled the whole house. You know, I, I believe that as God established the church, he wants to continue the church. I, I believe that for every time we gather, every time we do anything in his name, he'll fill the whole house. And the Bible said, fill the whole house where they were sitting and there appeared under them divided tongues as a fire. Their heads had a flame on each, every person had, had a flame. There was a flame for every person. And I believe that hasn't changed. There's a touch of God for every person. The Bible says they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak in tongues as the Spirit gave them the ability. And this church exploded. I mean, the wind blew, the fire fell. People were baptized in the Holy Spirit. The cities affected. You got people who are denying Jesus. They're now preaching the gospel. 3,000 people come to Jesus and it jumps into Acts 3. There's, there, there's the raising of a, a lame man and miracles began to happen. The, the power of God was so, so evident all through the book of Acts. And, and, and that's how Jesus established the church. And I don't believe that he's coming back for a church less powerful than the one that he established. I believe the church that he's coming back for is alive with the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. I know you're saying, amen, I can hear you by faith, but I want to give you, I want to give you five reasons that I believe our churches need the power of the Holy Spirit. Can I even be more forward? Why we need to let the Holy Spirit, I don't even like the word let because it's his church, he's in control, but, but, but not even make room, just give him the room, give him the, the, the freedom to operate and move and touch hearts and touch lives. I want to give you five reasons why I believe we need to see the Spirit of God move in the lives and in the hearts of our churches and see people touched by the power of God. Number one, because Paul preached it. Paul preached this whole idea of the moving of the Spirit. It's not a, it's not a new thing. It's not a from Azusa Street thing. This was birthed 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem. And Paul preached, and I want to read a scripture to you that I believe is a powerful scripture that I, that I love. It's a, it's a life scripture for me. First Corinthians and chapter two. And, and in verse one, Paul writes this. He says, and I, brethren, when I came to you, I did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I love that. Jesus Christ, who he was 
and crucified what he did. I thank God for Jesus. I thank God for Calvary. But, but the gospel, those two are indivisible. It's who Jesus was, the Son of God, God the Son. And it's what he did. He paid the debt that I could never pay. And Paul says, I want to know nothing other than Christ and him crucified. And he says, I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. And I want to look at verse 4. He says, and my speech and my preaching were not with the persuasive words of human wisdom, can I just say, I, I've heard so much preaching that growing up in church, I've been in Pentecostal church my whole life, 40 years. I've heard so much preaching and teaching that is human wisdom. And Paul says, I don't want to preach human wisdom. He said, my speech and my preaching were not with the persuasive words of human wisdom. He says, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So he talks about a preaching and a teaching that's coupled with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, a demonstration, a manifestation, a showing forth, an exhibition of supernatural grace and power so that your faith would not simply just be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. If my faith was in human wisdom, when humans fail, I wouldn't know what to do, but my faith has never been in those things. It's been in God's supernatural power, which is as powerful today as it was 2,000 years ago. The Bible tells us Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. What he did 2,000 years ago, he can do today. What he did 2,000 years ago on those shores of Galilee, what he did 2,000 years ago on the cobblestone streets of Jerusalem, he can do right now in America, in Australia, right across the world. I'm believing that we're going to see great things. Demonstrations of the Spirit's power. You know when it comes to the gifts of the Spirit? Nine gifts of the Spirit we read of in 1 Corinthians 12. You've got the gifts of utterance. They're the gifts that say something. The gifts of power, they're the gifts that do something. And the gifts of revelation, they're the gifts that reveals something. I always believe that when we come together in the house of God, if nothing's being done, if nothing's being said and nothing's being revealed, God's not there in, 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 in his manifest power. We, we need to believe God that the gifts of the Spirit would stir in our meetings. I was just in a meeting just recently. I was speaking for the Assemblies of God Pastors Conference in, in Arizona, in Phoenix. And and in the service, and I hadn't seen this for a long, long time, but in the service, it sort of, there was a still moment. And the next minute, there was a guy behind me, man, he started going off in tongues. I mean, he was praying boldly. It wasn't like he was praying, prophesying in other tongues, man. It was, it was wild. My right leg started to move. It was awesome. And then the next minute, there was a bit of a holy hush. And then another guy at the back gave an interpretation and gave the word of the Lord. And I, I tell you, that, that impacted me in a, in, in a profound way. It was a demonstration of God's spirit and God's power. And in many ways, we backed off that as the church. But I, I, it's, it's in my heart and I pray that maybe somebody watching might, might, might sense that this is of God. But I, I believe we've got to come back a little bit more, swing that pendulum back to a bit of, a bit of power, a bit of anointing, a bit of Holy Ghost activity. And, and you know, I, there's a scripture I love in 1 Corinthians, in chapter 14 and verse 39. Paul's writing is regulated the use of tongues. And I won't get into that uh, right now. Just he, ra he wraps it up a little bit and he says this. He says, therefore, brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy and do not forbid to speak with tongues. And then he says this. He says, let all things be done decently and in order. Let all things be done decently and in order. What are the things he says to let be done? That's the gifts and the graces and the anointing of the Spirit. You know, so often we're so committed to decent and in order that we're letting nothing be done. We've got to let some stuff happen in our meetings. We've got to let God move. We've got to let the meeting breathe. We've got to let people respond. We've got to say, Lord, would you come and fill the house and do something supernatural in Jesus' name? That word decently best translated as biblically, let all things be done, but let's just do it according to the word of God. But we've got to let things happen. I, I, I don't want our church to be so controlled that, that our, our run sheet dictates this, that, this, that. I want our run sheet still subject to the Lordship of Jesus, that whatever God wants to do in a service, we can come in with a plan, but let's believe that God's plan still prevails and that God will do something supernatural 
in the name of Jesus. Why don't you say a good amen to that? Number two, another reason I believe the church needs the power of the Holy Ghost. Number two is the move of the Spirit helps us all. Corporately, it helps everybody. The Bible tells in 1 Corinthians and uh, in 1 Corinthians 12 verse 7, it says, But the manifestation of the Spirit profits all. That word manifestation, phanerosis is the, is the Greek word, exhibition, expression. And the word profit means it's expedient and it brings together. So when you have a manifestation of the Spirit, it profits every person. I've been in meetings where some guy's moving in the power of God or prophesying, operating in the word of knowledge or the gifts of the Spirit. No one prophesied over me or prayed for me, but I left as though I'd had the word of the Lord. I left as though someone prayed for me and, and I'd had an encounter with God. Why? Because when God's power is moving, it might, there might be sort of one person really being the recipient of that moment. But you know, we're all benefiting from it. It's bringing us all together. There's something about a move and a demonstration of the Spirit in a meeting that unlocks something that helps every other person. Don't, don't underestimate that one word of knowledge that you have on a Sunday morning. I find when I'm praying for needs, I just on a Sunday morning in church, I try to hear from heaven. What am I praying for specifically? That word for somebody. It might be a word for somebody that the other person doesn't need, but just that operation and release of the gifts of God Prophets all. I've seen people at altar calls at camps and conferences and church, and you see one person get touched by the fire of the Holy Spirit. I mean, other people aren't necessarily getting touched by the fire of the Holy Spirit, but that one person having an encounter with God, I leave better. Something stirs in my spirit. Helps all of us. Number number three. Number three, the move of the spirit authenticates the gospel. The move of the spirit authenticates. The gospel, Mark 16, verse 20, says they went about, they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through accompanying signs. Amen. Just on a side note, I'm so glad that word amen's there. It means let it be done. Oh, Jesus, let it be done in the name of Jesus. I'm believing God's going to do that. But, but, you know, Jesus, the Bible says when he turned water into wine at the wedding feast at Cana, it was, it was the beginning of signs where God, Jesus, manifested his glory. That miracle, yes, it blessed that young guy. Yes, it helped that wedding. Yes, it caused no shame to come upon the family for not providing enough wine at this wedding. But ultimately, the reason Jesus did that miracle was to demonstrate his deity so we would know that the claims he makes are backed up with authenticating power. That's why we see the power of God in the book of Acts. That's why the church started with fire and anointing and power and, and grace. And we see it all through the book of Acts. And some people say it ended with the apostles. Well, you need to tell me why Stephen, who was an apostle, was not an apostle. Why was he moving in the Holy Spirit? This, this wasn't just for the apostles. We, we need an authentication of the gospel in 2022 as much as any time in history. I mean, the world's cooked. The world's messed up. The church, we need power. Oh, man, we need the power and the anointing of God's spirit in Jesus name. Why? Because it says to people, this power of God is not just in the pages, but it, com it comes alive in our ministries, on our messages, in our church services. And let me tell you, the best evangelist is still the Holy Ghost. He'll lead people to Jesus far better than you and I can. If we just let him have his way in some meetings, he'll knit their hearts and bring them to closeness with Jesus. And when we put that net out, people will come because they respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Number, where are we up to? Number four, number four, the move of the spirit unlocks the power of God. In Acts 1 and 8, Jesus says, he says, you'll receive power and he says, after that, the Holy Ghost will come upon you. You'll be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. I've got so much to say about this. They, they go on. After they said, well, Lord, won't you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Well, actually, before, he says, you're going to get baptized in the Holy Spirit not many days hence. And they said, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father's put his own authority. He said, but you shall receive power. Some of us, we want to know, no, 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 no. Oh, I've got to know this. I've got to know that. I've got to have the answers for everything. And yes, it's important. But there are times when Jesus says, it's not for you to know. He says, just go and wait in Jerusalem and be filled. Sometimes we do all of the Christianity with our head, but we actually need the Holy Spirit to unlock God's power because when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, he releases the power of God in your life. Somebody 
people ask me often, is the evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit tongues? You know, I'm an Assembly of God preacher, so we, we, I preach initial evidence. It's my, it's my conviction. But ultimately, that's not what Jesus actually said. He said you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So one evidence that you cannot argue with when it comes to the power of the Holy Spirit coming upon you and, and the anointing of God's Spirit, the evidence of the baptism of the Spirit Absolutely, his power is God's power. I know people that speak in tongues, I don't have power. We need to carry live the living power of Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit in our lives and on our ministries. I was preaching in Wellington, New Zealand. This is a few years ago, great church there, and the pastors are my dear friends. I was preaching in this church, and it's a capital city in New Zealand. You know that capital city? I was preaching there that morning, and I just had this thought. He says, you receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you to be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. You know, Wellington, New Zealand is the furthermost capital city from Jerusalem where that word was given. And I was preaching that morning in this church and it just dawned on me that I was preaching in the fulfillment of what Jesus said. I was preaching in a place that was the furthest possible place in terms of a capital city And another town in New Zealand, I think it's Taronga, is the furthest city in the world from Jerusalem. I preached there as well. And these cities, they're the ends of the earth. I mean, when when Jesus was prophesying, some of these people, I mean, Jesus himself had only moved, moved no more than 40 miles in his whole life. And this gospel got taken to the world by the power of the Holy Spirit. One touch of the power of God unlocks the power. And we see this fulfilled uh, in, in a global sense. And I'm believing we'll still see the power of God. Go from wherever we are to the ends of the earth. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria to the ends of the earth. Uh, 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 Jerusalem might be, you might be watching right now. I'm, I'm in Las Vegas now, but you receive power to be a witness in Las Vegas, in Nevada, in America, to the ends of the earth. I'm telling you right now, when we get touched by the Holy Spirit, he'll unlock the power of God and enable us to do what God's called us to do. You know, he gives you power, but he also gives you a heavenly language. That heavenly language is is the gift that God gives us to keep that power stirring up in our hearts and in our lives in the name of Jesus. And number five, when we preach and teach and release the power of the Holy Spirit in our churches, it keeps us in unity with the early church. You look at the book of Acts, you had Pentecost, you had revival at Cornelius' house, you had Ephesus, get touched in Acts 19. You had prison breaks and Acts 16 and Acts 12 and healings. I mean, one time Paul was preaching and a kid was sitting in the windowsill on the, on the, uh, up, upstairs, fell out of the window and died because Paul had preached till midnight and he'd fallen asleep. Paul raises him from the dead, has a bit more food and preaches till daybreak. I mean, it was wild in the book of Acts. And that's how the church started. I had this thought. I had this thought. If you're a member of the early church, and you decided, you know what, I'm not, I, don't, I, don't, I just don't like this church. I've sort of had enough. I need something a little less, you know, it's pretty full on. I need something a little more chilled. There wasn't another chilled church. They're all spirit-empowered revival atmospheres of faith where, I mean, Paul goes to Corinth. He's saying, you're basically, you're speaking in tongues too much. He says, I think God will speak in tongues more than all of you. You need to calm down. They were wild. Ephesus started in power and anointing. And Paul, and Paul would remind them, stay full of the Spirit. I remind you, Timothy, stir up the gift that's in you. The early church was alive. And, you know, sometimes now we'll go, you know, I'm, I'm, maybe some of you were in a Pentecostal experience and now you've looked for something super chilled. There wasn't a chilled option. I mean... Church was wild. Even Mary, the mother of Jesus, was Pentecostal. She was a tongue talker. She, was, she had fire on her head. I mean, it was alive. And, you know, when I think now of church, it's real settled and stayed and super religious. And then we look at charismatic and Pentecostal and go, well, that's a new fringe of church. It's not a fringe. It's how the church started. The fringe is, is, is in the drift. And I want to encourage us. Let's come back to what the early church had. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. It's God's anointing. And you and I, we need to be yielded to the Spirit of God. I, I look all through Scripture and I see little reminders. In 1 Corinthians 14, verse 39, forbid not. 1 Thessalonians 5, 19, quench not. Acts 7, 51, resist not. 1 Corinthians 12, 1, ignore not. Don't be ignorant. So let's not forbid. Let's not quench. Let's not resist. Let's not ignore Do not be ignorant concerning spiritual gifts. That just simply means do not profess to know, but not know. 
You know, I, I, a lot of people talk about the Holy Spirit. I remember, and, and they're experts, but they, they don't move in the Spirit. They don't operate in the Spirit. They've never seen a miracle. They've never walked in any kind of anointing that, that that's ever really been documented, yet they can be the experts on why the Holy Spirit isn't moving. I remember in grade nine, we dissected frogs. We cut them up. Hey, they were a lot of, it was wild. Can I tell you, I'm going to learn a lot more from a frog by watching it alive, watching it hop from lily pad to lily pad, a lot more than I'm going to learn from cutting the thing up and seeing how it operates dead. I, I want to watch the thing be alive. There's so much more to learn from a living thing rather than just dissecting. And I think so often we dissect the Holy Spirit and, and wonder why we don't fully understand. And often when we preach, and I talk to all my senior pastor friends, stop the 10-minute disclaimer before you preach on the Holy Spirit. Are you sorry for Jesus? Are you sorry for the Father? Why, why, we, why do we give disclaimers when we preach on the Holy Spirit? Oh, today, oh, you know, we're going to speak on something. It might be a little bit, nah, I'm proud of the Holy Spirit's work in my life. I wouldn't be born again without the Holy Spirit. I mean, we wouldn't even have the world without the Holy Spirit. One word from God, it was the Spirit that hovered over the waters. I mean, let's be, let's be people who stand up and say, God, I thank you that you saved me and filled me with your Spirit in the name of Jesus. Jesus, I want to pray. If it's possible, why don't you lift your hands to God? I'm going to pray for you. Father, I just bless every person in Jesus' name. Lord, your word tells us we can bless people with the Holy Spirit. I pray a Holy Ghost blessing would come on every person, every pastor, every leader. Stir up a fresh anointing, a fresh grace, a fresh touch of your hand in the name of Jesus. And Father, I just pray, Lord God, that you'd touch people. Even right now, let the anointing of heaven, let the power of the living God just come. Touch leaders and pastors and students and those. Lord, I don't know how people have come to log on today, but Lord, I pray, make yourself real to them by the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. And the church said together, amen, amen, amen. God bless you. Love you. See you soon.